Good afternoon. Welcome to the Medical Center Hour. My name is Marcia Day Childress from the Center from, for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, and I'd like to welcome you to our program today, a program called Healing Arts in the Hospital in the Hands. The arts and healing have been entwined since ancient Greece and probably before, but it seems that each generation must discover anew just how arts practice and not simply its products, can contribute significantly to human wellness and well-being. Indeed, in our own time, scientific biomedicine is relying increasingly on the arts for help in achieving its curative and palliative ends. Hospitals, healthcare professionals, and artists are putting the visual and performing arts to work to better understand the experience of illness and healing, to affect cures and assuage suffering, and also to forge compassionate communal bonds with the persons for whom they care. Even healthcare facility design now incorporates and integrates the arts into clinical care in new and fundamental ways. Just how might we now bring the twin practices of art and healing into greater alignment and to what effect? This Medical Center Hour today, as I mentioned, entitled Healing Arts in the Hospital in the Hands, explores two healing arts initiatives by way of example. One is a large-scale institutional effort, the hospital of our title. The other, an individual project, the hands. We welcome a trio of speakers. Visiting us from Gainesville, Florida, on my immediate right, is Shan's Art and Medicine Program Director, Tina Mullen. She will introduce the University of Florida's leading edge visual, performing, and contemplative arts programs for its hospitals and clinics. Now in its 20th year, Shan's Arts and Medicine is the premier model for hospitals, uh, for hospital arts programs worldwide. We also welcome uh, in the center recent University of Virginia graduate Lauren Catlett. Uh, and her art and architecture professor, Sanda Iliescu, on my far right. They will present Shared Doings and Sayings, Ms. Catlett's project that brought handmade art, conversation, and a sense of belonging to local elders with Alzheimer's dementia. Your handout includes short bio sketches of each of our speakers, uh, as well as some thumbnail descriptions of the two arts initiatives that we're featuring today. These presentations are necessarily brief, but we hope that they'll be evocative and provocative and inspiring of further efforts by our own health system and by other enterprising individuals, students, faculty, and staff here at UVA. Following the presentations, we'll have your comments and questions. The School of Architecture has recently established a Center for Design and Health a unit devoted to research into the many ways in which design of community, of the built environment, of healthcare facilities can improve the quality of life and foster health, well-being, and healing. The Center for Design and Health is our partner today in this Medical Center Hour. Uh, to Architecture Dean Kim Tanzer, who's with us today, and Professor Ruben Rainey, one of the co-directors of the Center, who's also here today, Thank you very much, and we hope this is the beginning of a productive partnership. We'll start with Tina Mullen, and I hope you enjoyed this program. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to do dual mics today so I can wander around while I talk. I'm glad to be here at the University of Virginia for the very first time. It's a beautiful campus, and I had a wonderful visit. I'm here to present uh, Shams Arts and Medicine Program, Shams Hospital affiliated with the University of Florida, where we did not invent arts and healthcare, just the best collegiate mascot on the face of the earth. <laughs> 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 um, a quick note about arts and healthcare for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Um, as Marcia alluded to, it's a concept that's been around, floating around humanity since the beginning of time. And the modern movement of arts and healthcare actually has been uh, gaining momentum for a very long time. There's an organization called the Society for the Arts and Healthcare, which has around 600 members um, throughout the United States and different nations across the world. So it has really been gaining momentum. And when we started, 
1990, I have to say, we, we started blind. We really weren't paying attention to what anyone else was doing. The reason we started was there were a few uh, faculty members at, at the University of Florida College of Medicine who were artists themselves and had a real interest in seeing if uh, there was a way that they could bring the arts into their clinical practice to improve the lives of their patients. So um, the director of the bone marrow transplant unit at the time, uh, John Graham Paul, who was a poet, opened the door for a couple of artists from the community to come in and start engaging his patient population in the arts. At the same time, another physician, uh, the chair of ophthalmology, who was a, a really profound collector of visual arts, wanted to see if uh, putting artwork around the hospital mm -hmm was going to improve the environment and improve people's impression of the clinics that they were being treated in. So that's where we started back in 1990, and I'm very happy to say that, that I've been with this program since its inception, so it's been uh, amazing to watch it grow. Uh, we began with two volunteers, uh, two volunteer artists on the bone marrow transplant unit and a very small exhibition program. It took about five years for us to gain the kind of momentum to become a fully funded department, which we are now. We are a department of Shands Healthcare. Uh, we're fully integrated into um, the hospital, which means our artists and residents are actually part of the clinical teams. We see patients because we get referrals from physicians and nurses to go into the rooms and see these patients. And we're a program where we're quite large. We have two. Um, two driving principles. We use the arts to promote wellness, and we use the arts to improve the clinical setting. Those are the things that we focus on. So the artists in the clinical setting. We have artists and residents, visiting artists, and student and community volunteers. So what that means is we have 14 paid artists and residents. These are artists who are employed by us on contract who come in and they manage volunteers, they develop programs, um, they are the link from uh, volunteer students into the patient rooms and those are the ones who are integrated onto the clinical care teams. We use dance, drama, creative writing, the contemplative arts, which is yoga, meditation, guided imagery, music and the visual arts. So we're really doing every art discipline that we can think of. Um, we have about 150 student volunteers. This is annually. Um, they come from the colleges of fine arts, medicine, nursing, and psychology, and a few other scattered colleges around the university. And we have about 50 visiting artists um, and community volunteers that come in for like one time, you know, artists that will come in from the community and perform on the piano or do a recital. They're not part, part of our regular crew, but they come in from time to time to do event-based performances. The other key piece to this program is art design in the hospital environment. And as I've been going around your um, health center here, I see that you have a significant amount of artwork in your building. It's really great to see. Um, we, um, we believe that using the arts as a fundamental component of the hospital's physical condition is very key to the presentation um, to our patients and families as they come into our clinical setting. Um, we have a collection of about 900 original works of art, and I have to admit, I'm guessing at that, even though I'm supposed to be responsible for all of them, I haven't really <laughs> kept it in a while. So, uh, could be more, could be less. And these original works of art, much like what you all are doing here, um, focus on uh, our artists of the region um, in North Central Florida, and they sort of cover the gamut. Uh, photography is a, a large part of our collection, but also drawing, painting, sculpture, fiber arts, and a variety of other things. Um, we use this artwork in both the inpatient and outpatient setting, uh, which is really kind of interesting. We can do exhibitions in, in either uh, location, but the permanent art collection is really all over the place. And we, like you, you know, it's, we're just sort of this kind of monolith of buildings that keeps growing and growing and growing, so you never know when you're going to turn the corner and see a beautiful painting or head into a clinic that is, you know, somewhere that you've struggled to find as a family member, and then boom, there you are with a a wonderful work of art, and it's a welcome. You know, it's a it's a way of bringing people in and kind of reducing the stress immediately when you engage these significant pieces. 
Another a very important piece for us is that the artwork created through the artist-patient collaboration, our artists and residents who are in the rooms doing work with patients, we use that artwork to impact our physical environment. The slide that you're seeing has uh, painted ceiling tiles. That was something that we did. Our, our lead artist in residence, Mary Lisa Katekas, came up with this idea um, many years ago. When we had our designation of a children's hospital within a hospital, our pediatric areas didn't look any different than our adult treatment areas. And it was a problem for the staff. They, you know, they, you can imagine, you know, nursing staff um, has been <coughs> delivering pediatric care since the beginning of our um, hospital. And many of the nurses have been there since the beginning of our hospital. And then they get this designation, well, now you're a pediatric hospital. And they look around and they don't, it doesn't look any different to them. So we decided to go in there and, and make it look different for them. And the brilliance of this idea was Mary Lisa walking around going, hey, we can paint the ceiling. So as, as is, most of our ideas are presented to leadership at the hospital, it's usually met with a resounding, what? <laughs> so then we have to go through the process of getting through infection control, safety, security, and everything else that everybody else has to do to say, I think we've got a way that we can safely do this. And what we do is we take a, a fresh ceiling tile out of the box, which facilities development provides for us all year long, um, take a clean ceiling tile into the room with a nice little kit of paints. An artist is in there, engages the, the family in how to create this tile. We take it back down to the, the um, zone mechanics and they put it up in the ceiling. We have, oh my gosh, we must have 35 requests per week for a ceiling tile activity. And the greatest thing to me about this, this has done a great thing for uh, the pediatric environment in, in a very inexpensive way, which is another key to being effective in these programs. But the best thing to me was yesterday, um, after a presentation that I listened to by Lauren, I'm standing there uh, meeting people as they're coming out of the presentation, and. Um, a woman from the Alzheimer's Association comes up to me and says, I was visiting my father in a hospital in Naples, Florida, and when I went into his room, he was painting a ceiling tile. <laughs> I was like, that's great. That's the effect we want to have. We want people to know about what we do, and we want them to do it too. I was very charged up by that comment. Um, the, the, one of the key pieces for us is creating partnerships uh, we are successful because other departments in the hospital want to see us as successful. The other piece to, to the job that I have is to be the interior designer for um, our health system. So the art program is fully integrated into what we call facilities development, which means that um, any time a construction or renovation project comes up, I'm going to go in and um, sort of give my opinion, which I am willing to do at any moment, give my opinion on what I think can be done with the project to bring aesthetics, the art and aesthetics, into whatever environment it is we are about to transition. So as an example, um, when we moved our um, pediatric intensive care unit from one floor to the next, um, nursing staff, as I'm sure you all know, gets a little nervous when you're going to talk about moving their environment because they're very comfortable providing care in a particular environment. We were not only going to move them to a new location, but we were going to redesign everything. We're going to make your nurse stations di different. We're going to isolate you a little bit more. We're going to split you guys up. So there was a lot of anxiety. So what we decided to do as an art program is before they left their unit, we'd go into their staff lounge and we created a project by which they could create small uh, ceramic tiles. They could paint them themselves. And with all of the ceramic tiles that the staff painted, we um, covered the walls of the elevator lobby of the floor that they were moving to so that when they come up for their move, they got to their unit and all of their artwork was already presented to them on their unit. It was their unit from that moment forward. It was pretty good. Engaging the staff. Another critical piece of, of what we do is we don't go into patient rooms if the staff doesn't want us there. We just can't be successful unless the medical staff and, and clinical staff throughout believe in what we're doing. So we work very hard to develop uh, programs designed to transform the work environment. Our artists will provide visual art activities and workshops on nursing units in their staff lounges to create um, team building. Our current most popular activity is tie-dyeing your scrubs, which is kind of outstanding. <laughs> so we'll just set up, we'll go in the, nurse, the staff lounge, get all the tubs out, put dye in it, and as they can, now not the scrubs they're currently wearing, but they do bring in extras. 
go in there with tie dye, but they do, you know, clean them up and wear them out, which is pretty funny. That's been, it's, it creates a tremendous um, enlightened sort of atmosphere on the work unit, um, especially on these units. We tend to work a lot with trauma, uh, transplant, some, some uh, levels of stress that are pretty high. We try to go in there and engage them in activities that give them opportunities to reduce stress in the moment. The mobile relaxation station brings the contemplative arts to the nursing units, and that is literally exactly what it sounds. It's a little cart that we've loaded up with portable DVD players so you can watch you know, guided imagery for a minute. It's got foot massagers. You can make yourself a cup of tea, and we just roll that baby right into the unit. Um, we also have, as you can see here, something that we call the serenity room, which is a, a, a about a 350 square foot room that we've renovated that staff has have access to um, that you can go in and see videos, you can sit in a massage chair, and we teach classes in there, yoga, dance, art, all kinds of different things. But one of the things that we learned in setting up this room was we actually increased the stress for several staff members who could never take the time to go use it. <laughs> Hence the moment relaxation station. So, you know, serenity now is like, uh, I can't get there. So the serenity room is open 24-7. It's almost impossible to carve out this kind of space in a clinical setting for this type of activity. And since we opened it, and it's been about four years, every year I have to sit down with leadership and justify why we shouldn't turn it into something else, like a reading room or a waiting room or a, a pharmacy for that, for, you know, for that particular area. And every year we give them um, as our justification, the comments that staff provide and why they feel that this room is important. And we did a study, a real quick study, informal study, and we opened the room. The number one reason that um, our nursing staff feel this room is important is because it's one of the few things that they have experienced in their work environment that makes them believe that Shams cares about their value. That's enough to keep the room open. This is, I love the idea of a flight nurse down there in the atrium. He's painting a gator. Of course he is. That's what they always do. <laughs> Engaging students. There came a time when we realized that our student volunteers were having extremely significant um, engagements as they were coming through our hospital, and we should probably investigate ways to make these relevant to the education that they were going through on campus. We partner with the College of Medicine to create student groups to link students with patients. So in other words, as a first year medical student, you can join a group um, that links you to the arts and medicine program and you will, uh, you will work with artists and you will go to different patient care settings and you will engage a patient in visual arts or music or drama or dance. Whatever it is the student feels they have the most talent in, which is always interesting to find out where the student's talents really lie. Then as a fourth year, when you no longer have time to be sitting at a patient's bedside making art or music or dancing with them, you get a prescription pad. And you fill out the prescription pad for the arts, visual arts, dance, music, drama, and leave that in the arts and medicine office, and that gets picked up by an artist. And you go to so the artist goes and sees your patient. So it's an it's a nice little um, process of um, getting students engaged, getting medical students engaged in the use of the arts at the bedside, um, engaging patients in very uh, humanitarian ways, having conversations that don't have anything to do with the way they're being asked to engage patients in other ways, and then as a fourth year, calling back to that experience remembering the kind of significant uh, engagement that they had with that patient and requesting that type of activity for their patient. Um, we always had this desire, uh, the physicians and, the physicians and nurses that started this program always had the desire that somehow the arts would become part of a healthcare practitioner's clinical practice. That was way back when we were idealists <laughs> and we didn't know anything about what the delivery of healthcare was really like. And what we've learned is that um, 
the, the pace of care does not allow a caregiver to sit and talk and make art and do all the things that they really are there to do. They're there to deliver very sophisticated medical care. So what we feel we do is come in behind them and deliver that kind of personal care through the arts that um, I, has been stripped away from the way nurses and physicians spend time in the room. These students also <coughs> engage in ongoing research projects. This is new for us, and I will say right now, the artists in arts and medicine are not researchers. We do not do research, but we partner with physicians who do. The photograph that you're looking at is a medical student dancing with a Parkinson's patient in our motion analysis lab. We are currently engaged in a two-year study, an NIH study, with our uh, neurology department to examine the effects of dance and movements on uh, persons with Parkinson. We're seeing some amazing things. Um, the, the physicians are gathering the information that they see while uh, our artists and students provide the activity. So this will go on over, over two years. Uh, information will be analyzed and we'll find out you know, what's going on. But basically what we're seeing is, um, as a, you know, an example, we had one gentleman with um, sort of the, the frozen, frozen feature syndrome. He no longer had the ability to emote to facial expressions. And um, since his participation in, in this study, he does. He has all that movement back in his face. And for whatever reason, he's not losing it when the activities stop. There's another gentleman who um, was, you know, wheelchair bound and he's not now. Um, but he is losing that when, when he goes back into his life. So there's all kinds of things that, you know, hopefully are going to be discovered through this. Whether or not I'll understand them, I don't know, but it'll get published. You all can read about it. Call me, let me know if you understand. So what we do is partner with physicians who want to investigate something, we provide the art engagement for that to happen. If we allow students to get engaged in that, then hopefully we're cultivating the idea that as they go into medical practice or they go into their art practice, they will start to investigate these things as well. So we also partner with Medical Humanities, which you have an outstanding program here at UVA. Um, and we have, Arts and Medicine has created a center at the University of Florida, the Center for the Arts in Health Research and Education. And that's really where we can develop courses and we can participate in research studies. So that is housed in our College of Fine Arts at the University of Florida. Um, it provides exceptional opportunities for um, the last piece here, students to travel. We travel to Africa, we travel to the Florida Panhandle, um, and they participate in um, arts and medicine rural health initiatives, which are pretty exciting. I'll tell you about those in just a second. So there's a lot of different ways. I think that's probably one of the most significant things that we've discovered recently is, or over maybe the past five years, is that you know patient care, which is really our core, is enhanced by providing some significant educational opportunities for the students who want to be engaged with us. Engaging the community, getting ourselves out of the hospital is critical. So we're, if we're going to say that we're a program that believes the arts can promote wellness, then we have to do it not only within the confines of our hospital and clinics, but we have to engage our community as well. And we do that um, through developing partnerships um, that through the arts that promote wellness. Um, Aim Together was our first effort at this, in which we partnered with the University of Florida Performing Arts Center. We were awarded funding by the National Endowment for the Arts to provide uh, the funds for top talent that comes, comes to our community and performs to stay one more night and go the next day to the hospital and perform for patients. Um, that's a model that we then used additional NEA funding to move all over the state of Florida. I think there are 13 programs now running where there are partnerships, or th in 13 different communities, there are partnerships between their local hospital and their local performing arts center that bring performance artists into the hospital. Um, Aim for the Panhandle, another um, initiative by, by us, um, partnering with our department, Florida Department of Rural Health, 
um, in understanding the model of arts and medicine and what it's doing in Gainesville, the Department of Rural Health asked us, do you think this would be effective in our rural hospitals around Florida? We, of course, said yes. So uh, they funded us to investigate. We chose a hospital um, in Apalachicola, Florida. Ever heard of it? It's a great place. We chose it because of the oysters and beer. But as it turns out, it was an amazing community to pilot this program. Um, it has, there are 23 rural health hospitals in Florida. They were developed in 1965 through a legislative initiative. They're significantly underfunded. They have maybe a daily census of six patients. They're all 25 bed hospitals. And they're pretty, um, they're pretty remarkable to see, especially, you know, like me, I spend my day in this amazing center of um, technology and advanced medical procedures, and I go to this little hospital, and I ask for a hospital tour. When I get in there, I'm standing at the nurse station, and the nurse says, well, there's one hallway, there's the other one, and that's our emergency room. There's your tour. So the thought, my thought was, what, what do I do? What do we do with a, a, a monolithic program on this size hospital. So we spent the, the next several days investigating with um, people in the community how this might happen. And what we discovered was that in these rural communities, there were all kinds of state-funded health agencies trying to pro pro uh, promote wellness. And they were sort of hit and miss. If we gathered them all together, and we put them in the room with artists, this little rural hospital, education, um, education people the, the, at the churches, everybody from the community, they could form their own way of delivering the arts in their community. So what they, what the model that they came up with in Apalachicola, the community came up with it themselves, was we will take our artists and we will go into a large location like the empty gymnasium in our high school and we will start an art program, Zumba class a watercolor class, ceramics class, and invite anybody in the community to come to it. And when they get there, every health organization in the community or in the county is going to be there to deliver health information. And it's been working incredibly well. It's unbelievable. So well that the Florida uh, Department of Rural Health has given us a grant to make sure we have this model in uh, every rural hospital by 2012. So it was also the, I don't, I don't know what it is, I don't know if y'all are experiencing this up here too, because I know you have um, significant rural health issues. Um, but then the, this project also got the attention of the Kresge Foundation, and they asked us to apply for a grant to help fund this, and they awarded us a $200,000 grant to keep this thing going for the next two years. I mean, that was, you know, a relatively significant, um, I guess, justification that this thing might be working. Oh my goodness. Aim for Africa is a process in which we, we um, partner with other organizations, uh, the, America, or the American Red Cross, Heal Africa, and Engineers Without Borders. And we take medical students, nurses, and artists to Africa, to three different communities, or three different countries, and begin uh, health initiatives in their rural clinic settings, which, again, the same kind of format. The artists go in first, they start drawing and painting uh, with the people in the village, find out what needs and wants are. Um, we start, we go to their clinic and take the artwork that they created for us and start painting it all over the walls, which sort of reduces the kind of um, intimidation they feel about going into a Western style clinic. Um, and then we get in there and paint murals all over the place that the nurses want us to, to paint about health initiatives hand washing, use of condoms, the food pyramid, and then the nurses use those meals to start teaching. And then the physicians or the medical students, young physicians, go in there and start delivering care. It's a great one. It seems to be working. So we went back this past year to the genocide camps in uh, Rwanda, and they, they expanded on their own, their health education murals, and they're still using them, so it's fantastic. So for us, bringing it all together, for me, after 20 years, bringing it all together, men. All right, four years ago, we start this initiative to um, uh, build a massive cancer hospital and trauma center, 500,000 square foot. We opened it November 1st, 197 beds, operating rooms, emergency trauma center, big conference center, resources center. You get the idea. You guys are doing this here. 
for us. This was our opportunity to use the principles that we've developed over the past 20 years and see if we could bring them to life in this building. Art and aesthetics as a fundamental consideration throughout the design build process from day one, four years ago, from when we started putting pencil to paper about what this facility was going to be, I was in the room as the voice of arts for this project, working with the architect, with the interior designers, not just it's going to be important to buy art for this building when we're done, but what does it look like where we put the art? How is it lit? What's the air quality around it? What kind of art do we Every consideration we could possibly think of so that as we went through the design build pro process, what typically would happen, you get to the end of the design build process, start buying paintings and realize, oh wait, this space isn't right for it. We've got to put in a change order. It costs us more money. Maybe we shouldn't buy the paint. So take those things out of the problem right at the beginning. The um, artists and students are working on it in every clinical area in this building. The staff were asked to provide the artwork for the patient rooms. The picture that you see here is one of our acute care rooms. The photograph over the bed was provided by our um, construction foreman for the project. Staff, I did a call to, artists, uh, call to artists to employees. They were asked to submit digital files of landscapes. Um, got 1,000 entries. I needed 385 images and was able to put up two images in every room but I think the piece that really made this thing strong was with every piece, I put up the employee's name, their job title, and where they worked in the building. So that as a patient or family member, as you're enjoying the artwork in your room, you're also seeing you know, that Ed Smith from IT made this photograph. All of a sudden, you, you realize that the people who come into your room and provide your care are people as well. And they do the same things you do. This place also has this place, Shands Cancer Hospital and Trauma Center. Uh, also has a big resources center, 1,300 square feet of space devoted to the delivery of educational programming and wellness for our entire community. So everything that we do, everything that we take into the patient rooms now, we can deliver far and wide to the entire community in this one resources center. It's pretty nifty. I feel pretty good about it. Ruben's seen it. He thinks it's swell. <laughs> so in conclusion, if the purpose of art is to nourish the spirit, then what better place to find art than in a hospital, where the spirit encounters its most critical moments. And I put these two pictures up because this is what it's all about for us. We can talk about how we're the biggest program in the States, and we're the Gators, we're the best. That is the fed end. <laughs> but really what it comes down to, okay, we're struggling this year, and I'll admit it. What it comes down to is, pictured there, um, our visual artist in residence with Kat Canal, a woman who, a young woman, young girl, she always presented herself as a young woman, young girl who waited for 18 months in that room, pictured there in the PICU, waiting for a heart and double lung transplant. We spent so much time with her. She was an amazing girl. Our friends um, up at uh, the Athletic Association, who do come down quite a bit and work with our patients, our basketball players love to make art, so they spend a lot of time with uh, the arts and medicine program. They became really tight friends with Kat. When Kat got transplanted and was out living her happy life post-transplant, the basketball team snacked her up, and she is now the official number one cheerleader for Florida women's basketball and goes into the locker room pre-game to deliver the pre-game speech <laughs> and goes into the locker room at halftime. It rocks and that's what it's all about it's about using the arts to break down barriers to build communication and to build relationship that's what arts and medicine is so i will now turn over to lauren who is a young woman who completely gets this to tell you about her outstanding project say that was incredible. <laughs> I hadn't heard um, the full um, description yet and I can talk to you more about that later. <laughs> that was so great. Um, but yes, good afternoon everyone. Um, 
and I'd like to thank you all for welcoming me here um, to speak about a collaborative project that I worked on um, over the course of the past year, and I've called this project um, Shared Doings and Sayings. Um, this project was inspired by my volunteer experiences um, with persons with dementia during my four years here at EVA. Um, and during the project, which was funded by the Center for Undergraduate Excellence, I organized art sessions for four memory care communities in Charlottesville. Um, and the art sessions were an opportunity for residents, staff, family members, and others to make art and to share stories. Um, and to preserve our conversations, I recorded the sessions on video um, or in writing. And excerpts from these conversations and a selection of artworks are now represented in a book um, also called Shared Doings and Sayings. And it's up here in the front. Um, so if you have time at the end, you can take a look through it. Uh, the title for this project comes from this quote um, from the introduction to the book, Dementia, My Meaning, and the Person. Um, and I'll read this. Uh, we can still inhabit the world of the person with dementia because it is the world we have always inhabited. Understanding meaning in this world is just to be minded as we are, with the potential for discursive interactions based on shared doings and sayings. Um, and I believe... Uh, in my experience in this project, um, this, this quote manifests itself in the fact that though there were, um, there were at times unexpected or unconventional contributions to our conversations, whether that was a piece of art, a story, or even a person's quiet presence, um, offered the chance for participants to engage with one another despite obstacles to language and expression that um, dementia often brings. And some precedents for this project um, are these three programs, which are especially designed for persons with dementia. Um, the first one, Memories in the Making, is an art-making program through the Alzheimer's Association. Um, Meet Me at MoMA is an art viewing program that was originally started at um, Museum of Modern Art in New York, but um, the UVA Art Museum now has a, a burgeoning program that's very similar to it. Um, and Time Slips, which is a storytelling program. And all three components, art making, art viewing, and storytelling were um, essential to, to my project, uh, Shared Doings and Sayings. Um, these are the communities that were um, involved in the project. Um, and they were the, the memory care communities, the Christopher Center at Our Lady of Peace, Bridge to Rediscovery at Morningside, the Reminiscence Neighborhood at the Colonies, and the Innovations Community at Rosewood Village. Um, and, and not only did the residents participate, um, but also family members that happened to be there, staff members, um, and others from, from outside those communities and from the university community. Okay, so um, now I'll show you some examples of artwork and some uh, stories from, from the project. Um, and as you'll see, there's a large variety among the works. Um, some are representational, others are abstract. Some are bold, others are, are very quiet. Um, some are collaborative and some are individual, but you'll see that they're all very distinctly personal. Um, these two paintings came from the same, or they, they emerged from the same photograph. We were working from a photograph of a flower. And um, as you can see, they're very different interpretations, very different styles of mark making, um, but just equally stunning pieces. Um, this drawing uh, came from an art session that I shared with all four communities. And, and for that session, um, I brought in a collection of leaves and I asked the residents to choose the ones that they liked the most and to respond to them. And um, so Ms. Bluestone, for her drawing, decided to, to trace the leaf and to um, color the inside with, with this bright pattern. Um, and then she also decided to incorporate a leaf into her composition. So I, I showed um, both ways that she, she wanted to present it. Here's a, some delicate watercolors by Mr. Gashard from the Colonnades. Um, and these two pictures, um, 
sort of came out of conversations that we had at Our Lady of Peace about trees, and we often talked about trees, and this could be because we had this beautiful view out into, um, into a forest in the room where the art sessions were held. Um, and during one of those conversations, two of the residents, um, Marie Norsey and Bill Cassida, whose pictures are up here, um, started to recite the poem Trees by Joyce Kilmer. You might be familiar with this. I think I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. And these are the lovely tree pictures that we made. Um, and the one on the left is um, actually a collaboration between a resident um, of Our Lady of Peace and a printmaking professor in the UVA art department. And the one on the right um, is a um, watercolor painting by a resident that was based on a photograph that was taken by a um, professor in the Slavic department here at UVA who was um, interested in this project and wanted to contribute. Um, this drawing came from an art session um, that I kind of designed as a collaboration and I, what I did was I brought in a large sheet of paper and laid it on the table and um, all the participants gathered around and um, I asked them to draw figures from their family or people at the table or just imaginary figures um, and this is the drawing that resulted and I called this the this art session the um, family portrait so this is our family portrait in that session um, these um, drawings I think strongly represent um, a resident, Miss Doris Ryan, um, her talent for figure drawing, which kind of came as a surprise because she hadn't drawn figures before. One day she was drawing and I made these three blue faces and I just encouraged her to continue to draw figures in, um, in the future. And um, the one on the right is actually a sort of accidental collaboration. Um, what happened was I was drawing a picture of Miss Ryan and I set the drawing aside and then um, Miss Ryan picked it up and added her own lines to it and she said it looks like her grandmother. <laughs> and here's a watercolor by Molly Fergus from um, Rosewood Village and I believe for this one um, we were um, working from a still life of apples and um, Miss Fergus decided to use the colors for one of the apple in her composition. Um, and painting by Lily Holmes from Morningside. And uh, two paintings by Ann Love and Gabriel Swafford from the Colonnades. And I paired these together because they were from the same art session. And finally, another example of the, the leaf prompt by E. Holiday from Morningside. I just thought this was a very strong composition. Um, let's pause here to talk a little bit about um, the benefits of making art that really became evident over the course of this project. Um, but I'll start first by saying um, that many residents were hesitant and even resistant to making art. Um, some had no interest, others were afraid because they hadn't made art before, um, and others insisted that they couldn't draw or paint. And to give you one example, uh, one Morningside resident told me repeatedly that she couldn't draw. She just absolutely insisted on it. But on two occasions, when she was collaborating with other participants, it became clear that while she had no interest in drawing, she was quite fond of directing. <laughs> <laughs> that is, she conceived the idea for a picture and then instructed her collaborators how to put it on paper. <laughs> So we had some, some interesting um, pieces come out of that. Um, so in this sense, making art was not only about art making. Um, it became a medium in which we could engage with one another and share our various strengths, weaknesses, and experiences. Um, and it was a way to spark conversation and keep the conversation going. Um, and all contributions to that conversation were welcome, whether it was a single mark on a page or an elaborate rendering of a seascape um, whether a painting or a song, poem, or a silent look of acknowledgement. Um, moreover, it was a way for me to, for me personally to engage with the participants because it was something that was familiar to me that I could share. Um, but making art and the artwork made in this project have another purpose, um, and that is they tell a story. 
and I've shared with you a few stories that are partnered with some of the works in this slideshow. Um, and I'd like to share one more that I think really captures the essence of this project. Um, and this is from July 27, 2009, and I'm speaking about a resident of the colonnades, um, Ms. Ellen Wheeland. Um, our conversation on July 27th revealed Ms. Wheeland's awareness of and struggles with the obstacles to expression she was experiencing. Throughout the conversation, she time and again referred to containment, admitting, I don't want to have to be contained. She seemed acutely aware of her captivity and her participation in it. I'm caught in what I'm entering, she said. But she also saw a way out. Ms. Wheelan bid me farewell that day with a piece of advice. You have to learn in all directions. Um, and this piece of advice has really directed my efforts from then on as I tried to think of different ways to engage with the participants. But I think Ms. Wheelan's quote also speaks to the capacity that I saw in the residents to express themselves by other means when conventional means were lacking. And I learned so much from them in this way. Um, and so, moving on a little bit, actually Ms. Whelan's um, artwork is um, pictured here on the postcard for a show that unfortunately is uh, going down today, but there's still a few hours if you want to check it out. Um, shared doings and sayings, and it's over at the um, Dean's Gallery in the Architecture School. Um, it, it features works and excerpts from conversations from some of the participants in the project. Um, this is the cover for the book that I already mentioned. Um, and just looking forward a little bit, um, you know, as this part of the project is coming to a close, um, I guess at this point there seems to be some, some discussions that are continuing um, even though uh, some of our, our conversations within the communities have um, kind of taken a, a break. Um, and um, examples of those would be this one for example. We had another discussion yesterday um, in which we had many community members and university members to discuss the, the topic of um, art aging and, and healthcare um, and the relationship between them. Um, we also were fortunate to have um, three of the retirement communities, uh, some residents from those communities come to see the art show, um, which was wonderful that they got to see, some of the artists were there too, and they got to see their own works, and we talked about the artwork. Um, but I, I guess I will um, just close with a question, which is um, how we can sustain these conversations and share the fruits of those conversations with others. Um, how might programs such as shared doings and sayings be sustained? Um, and we've seen an example, an excellent example of this um, in the Jan's Arts and Medicine program and how they, they've, um, you know, started pretty small but it's expanded tremendously and, and it's very successful. Um, and my hope is that the arts will continue to lend a helping hand to persons in the hands of illness um, in pursuit of health and well-being in our community and among its members. So thank you again for having me. <laughs>
I will speak as a practicing artist, uh, uh, and I would like to make a couple of points that I think would be useful to you as a medical community uh, to understand about the field of art. Uh, there is aesthetics in it. There is beauty, certainly. There are the beautiful products that we can put on the wall. But there's also a human activity, a kind of dance, if you will, uh, that concerns us. There's also an ethic of making art. Often we think about the artist as a young, vigorous person at the height of his or her health. And particularly in the 1950s, when this picture was taken, this is Jackson Pollock in his New York studio, we think of him as a male. Uh, that is, there's nothing wrong with that, and there are wonderful artists uh, uh, continuing to practice today. And the image that you just saw, sorry, previous to this, uh, uh, was a New York City-based artist, contemporary artist, by the name of Bryce Martin. As you can see here, the process of painting with a very long ayanta stick, as opposed to a brush, is very much part of the making of these paintings. But let us not forget that a wonderful artist such as Henry Matisse, actually also working in the 1950s when Jackson Pollock was making his flatter paintings, was continuing to make the most wonderful, colorful, joyful, delightful collages as a wheelchair-bound individual at the end of his life. So one thing that the arts can teach us, and here we have another picture of Henry Matisse in his bed, using a stick to paint on the wall. Another, another wonderful lesson that the arts can give us is that every precious, every moment of life is precious. And even at the end of their life, there is always imagination, there is creativity, and there's certainly incredible things that can happen. Uh, this is one of Lauren Catlett's own drawings. And she is so modest always, but she has been my art student uh, uh, in four different cor uh, courses. We might as well call you an honorary architecture degree uh, 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 student. Uh, and this is one of her drawings of, of one of her collaborators, for sure, Drew doings and say. And this is another one, a watercolor, that Lauren also did during the sessions. So what's really important to me here is this kind of connection, as Tina Mule has put it. It is not just Lauren as a professional artist making art. It is always the environment in which she is working, and very much so the subject of the artwork is involved. In this case, this is one of her collaborators. Now, um, I have been making arts for a long time now, and I'd like to generally work with both children and people uh, uh, who are the age of population. In that sense, I kind of address the beginning and the end. There's a beautiful medieval song that says, in the beginning is my end, in my end is my beginning. And I find that there are many similarities in creating artwork with children. This is a project that I did uh, in 2006, it is called Why Do You Draw? It was done at the School of Architecture with a group of third graders. And on the wall up there, you see the result of this project. Now, um, I'm missing a little bit part of this quote, but I will read it from my sketchbook. Um, somehow, part of my slide is being cut off. One thing you know about professional artists is they always carry a sketchbook with them. And in that sketchbook is every idea that they've thought about that is important. Um, this quote by uh, Leo Tolstoy, the Russian novelist, tells us what art is not. Art is not the production of pleasing objects, and above all, it is not pleasure. But it is a means of union among people, joining them together in the same feeling. And it is indispensable for the life and progress toward well-being of all individuals and of humanity. This was written in 1896, and it's part of a book which you have on your bibliography called What is Art? Now, as much as I love Tolstoy and his writing, I would say that art is also the production of pleasing object. And there are times when art can be pleasure, and there is nothing wrong with that. Also, it is an activity that we can share together, and it can build community. So I would slightly amend Tolstoy's quote here 
as I did here. You can see it's a little bit cut off. Um, how can art bring people together? Well, one thing is by making artwork collaboratively. Making a painting together joins us in a very natural and simple way. In some ways, it points out distinctions. The larger hand belongs to an adult, the smaller hand belongs to a child. Together, they make a painting. And this, what this talks to me is art as relationships, as connections, as well as beautiful objects. Uh, and here you see two other third graders working on that project I did a couple years ago, Why Do You Draw, uh, working with one of my graduate students, uh, uh, making that painting together. Now, in painting, as in life, relationships matter. So when I read a painting such as this by Sue Sensor, who was one of uh, Lord Capra's collaborators, what matters here for me is where those figures are placed, how tightly they are placed together, and then they form a group. That group is not at the center of the page, it is off to the edge. Those kind of things which artists are attuned to matter. So art is very much a matter of relationship between one thing and another. Um, in this leaf drawing, the concentric quality of those circles that go around an empty space, the leaf itself, is absent, matter. And what matters here is the relationship between those forms, just as what matters in life is the relationship you have with other people. You might be a mother, you might be a grandmother, you might be the son and daughter, the uncle, or the friend or the lover of someone else. That relationship matters. I'm going to go quite quickly here. When we look at paintings at artists, uh, as artists, we see the space in between. We don't only see the two birds almost touching each other, but we see the fact that there's a very tense and beautiful space between them. When we look at this uh, uh, painting by Lauren Caplet, we realize that background also matters. Here she took a wooden board. She didn't touch the shape of the bird. She just painted around in the context. So it's not so much about what a form is. It also matters what is surrounding it, what is the context. And this is one thing that arts can teach us. Similarly, when I see a painting such as the one called Why Do You Draw up there on the wall, which was made by children, myself, and as well as my own graduate students, I know that it is not just about the object, but it is also about things like the sense of touch, the children touching each other. And that becomes a metaphor for the way you make a painting. When you make a painting, you take a brush and you let it touch the paper. When my mother was actually passing away five years ago, I was in the process of writing a book, editing it. Uh, many people uh, at this university are included. I worked with them, I edited them, as well as writing two essays called The Hand and the Soul. The reason I called it The Hand and the Soul is that as my mother was dying, the one sense that remained to her was the sense of touch. Uh, by the way, she had metastatic cancer, brain tumors, and um, it took about a year for her to pass away. So it became very important to me to title this book The Hand and the Soul, because I realized that our hands and the way they touch each other the way an artist touches the paper is very important. Here's the cover of that book. This is the only drawing I was able to make uh, of my mother while she was ill that year. And interestingly enough, it was a drawing of her hand. And I'm sure that you as medical students would recognize all those wonderful tubes that are meant there to care for her. When we see a painting such as this one by Doris Ryan, what I'd like us to remember is that it is not simply white shapes on a piece of paper. It is a tactile material that somebody once made, and it's about that relationship of touch, both as you look at it and imagine yourself touching it, but also as it happens as an experience of creation. I think I'm going to stop now because I know we're very late, but I thank you very, very much for being here.